Welcome to STEM Lab, where we discuss preparing students for success in a rapidly changing world. And here's your host, Michael Newsom. Very happy to have you here today on this second episode of STEM Lab. I'm here with my co-host, Nicole Kreger. Nicole, how's it going up there in North Carolina? I'm doing good, Michael. Enjoying the beginning of fall weather here. Yes, Nicole, I remember you very well. Uh, when I first started at the governor's school, the very first faculty meeting, I think you sat behind me and to the right. And we've gotten to know each other really well over the years. I think in particular when you became department chair at math, we became really good friends. That's true, Michael. And you actually became the math department chair before I did. And we started working together at that point. Yeah, I don't think we had interacted much before you were in charge of the math department, despite not being a mathematician. Yes, I found myself a math department chair. I had been an economist for 18 years and working at a university. It was a great growing experience for me and really taught me about administration and secondary schools. And I was very happy, though, when you were able to take over and provide that kind of professional expertise. Of course, now you have continued to grow into administration and you've done a lot. So you like administration? I like teaching and I enjoy administration as well. I don't think I want to be a full time administrator, at least not right now, but uh, I enjoy having an in a say in in what happens at the school and being able to kind of make a bigger ch impact and change in my students' lives that I can make just in the classroom. But I love that like one on one interaction with students that I get in the classroom. So I would be sad to, to lose that. And I remember you told me that even when you were younger, maybe it was in elementary school or high school, you knew you wanted to be a math teacher. Is that true? That is true. I knew I wanted to be a teacher starting in a fourth grade. Uh, so fourth grade, I said, oh, I want to teach. I'm going to be a fourth grade teacher. I went to fifth grade. I said, oh, I'm going to be a fifth grade teacher. And that kind of followed me for a while. And then finally I got to high school and that's where I was like, ah, I want to teach math. You were a big part of the creation of this podcast. And we started talking about it. And we realized what we really wanted to do was to bring information and guests that would help policymakers, teachers, and administrators in STEM education. So who did you bring us today? Michael, today we're talking to Joyce Simoniak. She's a visual arts teacher at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, often called IMSA. Uh, she has over 30 years experience teaching both at the high school and college level. She her earned her master's in fine art from the Governor State University. And we invited her to join the STEM lab because she has experience teaching at a science school and integrating art and science. She teaches classes like digital photography, graphic design and technology, scientific illustration, observational drawing. So she has experience both as an artist and as a teacher. And we thought that integrating this idea of art and science um, and how do we teach art so that it helps science, how do we teach science um, with the, the art side of things. So that is why she was our guest on STEM Lab today. So Joyce, welcome to the STEM Lab. And you are an art teacher, but you're on this podcast for a reason. So can you talk to us about how art fits into STEM education? Well, I can talk to you about how art fits into STEM education. It, it fits in so many different ways, but what actually ends up really happening is how we fit STEM into the arts. It's not necessarily art going into STEM. Although if you think about STEM and you think about the arts in it, Every single thing has to do with art. Think about someone creating the cell phone. They actually had to have an artist design it so it's easier to read. Um, all the apps had to be easy to read. So all those things were designed by artists. So that's one example of art in this, within the STEM. Um, but here at IMSA, what we do is we actually created classes that involve STEM. So one of the classes that I created is scientific illustration. It is based off of simple drawing, like they learn different tools, yet they have to do research on very specific specimen. So I borrowed specimen from the science lab. I still maintain them. <laughs> they don't know I still have them. It's been a while. Um, but my students look at them. They have to draw from a very specific specimen. And it works really well because now they're learning drawing, they're learning scale proportion, and they're learning about what they're actually drawing. So that makes a huge, huge difference. 
and they have to do research. So one of the biggest things we do for research is we'll actually have them like research a beetle. So they have to research it and then they're gonna go ahead and make a completed drawing of the beetle and then they have to do a detail. So they might do a detail of the beetle's head or the beetle's arm. We actually have microscopes in the classroom where students can enlarge like the foot of a beetle, the head of a beetle, and they actually have to now go back and measure it and enlarge it so when it does go onto a drawing, they can figure out the exact scale and proportion. In a lot of cases, it might be like anywhere between four and 10 times larger than the actual foot of the beetle. So we involve math when it comes to that. Um, in other cases, when they're doing any kind of 3D design, and we have done several, as a matter of fact, the class was made specifically because we had a science teacher who asked students to design hearts and to model them. Well, if they don't know how to use the modeling materials, how do you model a heart? So I designed a class called 3D Design Fundamentals, and the students are taught how to model. Granted, they're not allowed to do the heart, but how to use the materials to model. And in some cases, even in that class, we'll actually start working with an X, Y, and Z axis for them to complete a project. Um, going to the 3D design class, we had a student who did a read type design. It was phenomenal the way they did it. And then we added the colors of the rainbow in plastic tubes. The idea behind that was she wanted the tubes to show when she put light how we can get a rainbow effect. So now not only did they have to figure out the velocity in which this item needed to turn, but how far apart those glass tubes had to be for the rainbow effect to hit the wall. And that was the artwork. Not only was it the completed piece, but it was the idea that they are now creating this rainbow on the wall effect using light, using velocity from a motor, and trying to figure out exactly where those pillars belong to make it effective and have that continual rainbow. So we do a lot of different things like that. Um, we have many of the classes are actually geared towards having STEM students working on them because we're in a math and science school. So we now have to add the actual science into the arts or we can add the art into the science either way but it works both ways. It mainly works with the science coming into the arts. And that's pretty much how we start our classes is every single class is involved in either some sort of math or science or research, and it all ties together very nicely. So you are trained as an artist, uh, but it sounds to me like you're doing a ton of science and math in your classes. How how have you learned all of those pieces and how do you, how have your students taught you some of the science and math as well? Well, my students teach me every day. I will, I will openly admit that. And that is actually my, my main philosophy in teaching and in learning. Even as a teacher, I can learn something new every single day. And that's always been my goal. And yes, you know, when it comes to organic chemistry, I'm really not good at it at all. But my students teach me and they tell me what they're doing and we can go ahead and involve those different things. My background, yes, is fine art. Um, so I do understand the arts, but the arts have also been reflective of the sciences ever since I've been in the field. So if you think about it, everything that you do is science-based. Um, the amount of chemical to the amount of paint, the amount of water to paper when you're doing printmaking, the type of prints you're doing, involving infographics when you're designing infographics, depending on what they're, what they're doing and what kind of infographic you have. Like right now, we just finished in Scientific Illustration a huge project that involved both math and science. I had students doing life-size sea life with a very specific style of dissection. So they had to draw these sea life creatures to size from an image that they took, and it may have been only a small image. They would have to Google an image or actually several images because we also abide by copyright laws. 
So they would work from several different images, but the images were printing out at like two and three inches. Well, a nine foot whale came out of a two inch drawing or a two inch image of a live whale. And then they actually incorporated the skull and the jaw into it. So that was their bisection. So it all kind of just naturally ties together. And the idea behind art in science, science in art, either way, it always works. And that's pretty much how you end up learning it because anything you do with art is a matter of scale proportion, what, whether you're drawing or creating, um, it has to do with scale and proportion and mainly proportion and amounts of chemicals, depending on what type of medium you're working in. And it's in every single medium across the board. So you do have to know some science, even to be an artist. Um, my personal work, I used, I know it's going to sound really strange, I use smoke to create. So it depends on the amount of carbon in each tool that I use will depend on how dark or light that carbon mark is going to be. So it is all about science. That is so awesome, Joyce. You know, I've never really thought so much about how art and science are, are interchanged. Is that something that your students are surprised by as well? Very much so. I think they come in and they think that they're just going to walk in and create anything without thinking about it. Well, okay, sometimes that does happen. And we do things just to relieve stress sometimes. But it all involves everything. They have to think unrealistic terms depending on what they're doing. And in a printmaking class, they were just struggling just minutes ago because they could not figure out the right scale of water to ink and how they're going to do this and hand pressure and the different types of papers that might be used. So every time you change an item, you have to change the way you think. So if you're changing the weight of the paper, you have to change the amount of water or the amount of ink you're using. So it all comes into play no matter what you're doing. Yeah, that really, that makes a lot of sense to me. It sounds like there are certain topics in a math or science class that we could really pull the art from instead of teaching it kind of in a routine way. We could use what you're doing in your art classes to teach proportions instead of, oh, let's let's just look at a figure that we already have. So that is really awesome. Have you had any of the instructors at the school reach out to you to um, try and do an art uh, part of their classes to, to teach different ideas? Well, we do. And we do a lot of cross curriculum. Like I said, the one class 3D design fundamentals was designed specifically because one of our science teachers wanted their students to do models of a heart. Um, we also have teachers who are now doing graphic novel. This all students are coming in, it involves the arts. They have to be able to communicate those ideas visually. And even when we're doing things like our in soliloquium here, students have to be able to understand how people can actually read correctly instead of, you know, there's, so students have to be able to create a presentation that people can read and not get overwhelmed with text. So that comes into the graphic design class. We learn all those basic rules of trying to enhance a presentation. And it all involves the art, whether you're doing a presentation or you're learning to do a graphic novel or modeling a heart. All those things are important. And that's where we bring the arts into. You, you mentioned when we talked on the phone that you're uh, helping other schools with the curriculum for the scientific illustration class, I think, in particular, right? So is that a class that not many schools teach? And how are you helping them add that class? Well, we're sharing our curriculum with that class. And that's what makes it a lot of fun is that we're actually working with other schools. Initially, that class started working with um, Collegio San Carlos in Milan, Italy. So we actually paired up with them initially. They came to us and we worked together to come up with that curriculum. And now the curriculum is being shared at other math and science schools. And it's just a very simple way of joining that science back in. And that's where the microscopes come in to our classroom is students have that ability to look at specimens, and then draw it and figure out the scale and proportion. And the nice thing about it is we're able to 
share those images that we're creating, not just with other schools in the curriculum, but through our digital comments. Cool. So your students can see what the students from other schools are doing and are they able to like comment on that and uh, interact with those students beyond just seeing the artwork? Well, right now it's still new dealing with other schools. We did it initially um, with our school in Milan, but now we're doing it more and more with other schools. So we're hoping at this point, the one school that we're going to be working with is that what we want to be able to do is we're going to do the visual research on our side and send it to them. And they're going to do the drawings for us. And they're going to do their visual research and send it to us. And we're going to do their drawing. And then we're going to cross them back over again. And I'm hoping once this is all done and all worked out, that we're actually going to go ahead and create a book that both schools can share equally. What's your favorite class to teach or a favorite lesson within a class? I think the funnest project that we did at one point, we did it last semester. We're going to do it again towards the end of this semester, was when we made Alegrias. So it is um, an art from Mexico. And what it is, is they're fictitious characters. However, we involved more than just our Hispanic students in it. We actually asked all the students to come up with a spirit animal. They took an online test as to what their spirit animal was. And then they were in teams and each team had to put a portion of everybody's spirit animal into the alabrias. So they came out really fun. Um, my biggest mistake in there, I said the smallest it could be is four foot. We had six foot creatures around our school. So it was a lot of fun to watch them build and design and the engineering that had to go into it was just amazing. So it was a lot of fun to do that. Um, we're definitely doing that again this year, but I'm going to tell them minimum would be two feet, not four. <laughs> That's great to be able to uh, take that idea and then be able to change it. And how wonderful it is to be a teacher and be able to say, I can't pick a favorite class because I just love all of them. Uh, it's clear, Joyce, that you have a passion for teaching. What really motivates you to teach? Oh, probably the same thing if you ask any teacher. The idea that you see that light go on. The minute that light goes on and they're like, I got it. I mean, that is the most exciting thing for a teacher to see is, that students light go on in their head and they finally get it after struggling for however long. I mean, they can struggle for weeks and then all of a sudden it just clicks. And that's what's the exciting part. And to watch your students get excited about what they're doing and see their passion come out in it. Those are the most important things to me is I want them to learn something new every day. Just like me walking into work, I want to learn something new every day. On the phone, you mentioned artificial intelligence and art and that you were writing an AI policy for IMSA. Can you talk about how AI is playing into the art classroom right now? AI in the classroom is very new for us. And yes, I did start writing a policy that our students have to abide by. A lot of it is pretty much in depth because I don't want students to just assume that AI is the answer to everything. So first of all, I do have students that are required to do research. And part of the research requirement for AI is they can quote from AI, they have to reference it just like they would a regular book, but they also have to send me the screenshot that they took from AI. I also ask them to give me the screenshot of where they found the information if it's on the web. So this way, I'm very aware of what they're doing, where their references are coming from. It takes a little bit more to do a bibliography for them, but at least I don't have to look up bibliography references for 80 students. I can just look and see where they've gotten their screenshot, and I always ask them to highlight that information. So that's one of the bigger things that we started. What we're doing with AI in the classroom is, for example, our digital photography class. This is the, the first one that's going to be exposed to AI, at least in the visual arts. So what we're doing is students are going to be assigned um, a landscape or whatever we decide, and they're going to decide it as a class. If they want to do people or a landscape, that the whole entire class is going to vote on what the subject matter is going to be. Once we decide that, 
then what they're going to do is they're going to take that image and they're going to upload it to AI and they're going to find three artists that they like. So it could be um, Rivera, anybody. They're going to have to look at those artists and then what they're going to do is once they upload their piece of artwork, they're going to ask AI to show that baseline piece of art or photograph in the style of one of those three artists. And then they're going to have to evaluate whether it actually ended up looking like the artist. So if they do something from Diego Rivera, let's say, then they print out their landscape that was done in the style of Diego Rivera, and then they have to evaluate it. Does it actually look like his artwork? So that's what we're starting. And like I said, digital photography is going to be one of the first classes that we're going to involve AI in. Awesome. That sounds like a, a fun mix. And that sounds similar to how I'm using it in my math class. It's kind of asking AI to do something and then having the students analyze what it produces, uh, whether it be good or bad. So, Joyce, do you have any last words that you want to share with our audience about teaching art and its connection to STEM? Art is STEM. And STEM is art. They all go hand in hand. And we just have to remember that. We can't eliminate the sciences from the arts and we can't eliminate art from science because without the two, neither one exists. Joyce, the world is changing a lot right now, especially with AI being introduced recently. How do you see art fitting into students' futures and the need for art for them in the future? Well, art falls into every single aspect of everything. It falls into AI. Think about it. Simple things like a Roomba that's considered to be AI. Somebody had to design what that actually looked like. A robot just can't do that. And even to this day, I tell my students when we're doing anything in Adobe, because we have the whole Adobe Creative Cloud for our students to use, that Adobe's only as good as the person is who's behind the computer. Computers can think fairly well nowadays. Robots can create anything that we want them to create, but somebody has to do that initial creation first. It has to tell the robot how to create it, what it's going to look like. So it does take art in order to do that. And then you add the science end into it as to how is this going to work? They're always going to go hand in hand, even as we advance into the future and we rely more and more on robots. Someone has to tell that robot what it's going to create. It's not just going to make it up on its own. But yes, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. Well, Nicole, listening to Joyce, there are a couple of things that really stand out. First, she said art is science and science is art. And second, she mentioned how the future economy will likely reward those students who are able to bring artistic creativity into the STEM disciplines. What did you think? I thought very similar things, Michael. And the one thing that I really took away from what she said was how I think I should be utilizing artists in my classroom uh, when she started talking about using the XYZ axis to describe things artistically. I was like, oh, that would fit perfectly into a Calc 3 class. And uh, so it sounds like she has a good um, interaction at IMSA with the, the other science disciplines and I know I've occasionally called on on our art teacher, um, Alyssa, uh, to help me out, but I think uh, that's really kind of a an area where I could use more, especially visualizing things mathematically, which is sometimes hard for students to do. Well, that was great, Nicole, and I'm glad you were able to bring Joyce to us. And remember, until next time, keep learning and growing. You have been listening to STEM Lab, produced in the studios of the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. 